Good afternoon, everyone. Once again, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Science Symposium 2019, sponsored by the Rancher Foundation. We're here at 533 Diversity, and we welcome all of you aboard. Uh, just now, Joshua Wilson is going to, to present. Uh, Joshua graduated from Arizona State University in 1987 with a degree in Decision Formation Information Systems, specializing in human behavior in organizations, followed by certification from ASU's Nonprofit Management Institute. Joshua and his late wife, Teresa, lived and worked for 19 years at Sunshine, Sunshine Acres Children's Home in Arizona, an orphanage on 110 acres, serving 60 children and staff. His position there during the last seven years of his tenure was as pastor and business administrator. During this time, he founded a music teachers association and served 10 years as its co-president. He taught classical piano and music theory since the year 2000 and is a jazz performer. Since discovering the Urantia book in 1977, he has dedicated himself to its promulgation through study groups, co-founding the Grand Canyon Society of Readers of the Urantia book, speaking on radio shows and webinars, publishing essays and e-books, and providing music for conferences. Joshua has written a number of articles on topics harmonizing science, philosophy, and religion. Science essays include Morphinogenesis, The Mother's Creative Way, Thought Adjustment Between the Two Brain Hemispheres, Lamatri and Einstein, A Day with No Yesterday, and De Broglie and Bohm, Making Ways in Quantum Physics. These last two essays explore the nature and realities of space, space force, and matter energy that result in the interaction, interactive phenomena of linear gravity. As religion, open quote, supremely concerns itself with the scientists, close quote, space is devoted to these writings, to the striking personal, moral, and religious sentiments of these prominent scientists who have shaped our world. Joshua is widowed with three daughters and seven grandchildren. His daughters are all professionals in the health field. I present to you Joshua. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, so we're talking today about uh, linear gravity, uh, sometimes called material gravity. And uh, we're not talking about uh, paradise gravity. Uh, or much about the topic of time, either. Where I, I would love to do that, and everything's inextricably linked. But we only have so much opportunity to be with each other, so we're just going to pretty much confine this to a linear gravity. So it's yeah, it is like a dance. So wh when's the last time you were on the ballroom mm -hmm. dance floor dancing with somebody? Well, maybe you remember. Somebody starts, somebody moves, you respond, you make a turn, and uh, and we love to dance. It's a fine art, just like we like to make music together and uh, uh, all kinds of social interactions. Well, this, this dance thing does have uh, some of these qualities where there's a constant response. I guess it is kind of like jazz music, where um, a phrase is made and then a response is given and then there's a variation and then there's a recapitulation. This is constantly going on because the universe is like one vast information matrix and gravity is the keeper of the score. So uh, these three things, space, force, and you can call it energy matter or matter or energy or whatever you want to call it. For now, we'll just put a hyphen in there and call it energy matter. Um, so just kind of a overview of, of what this concept is as I see it in the Arantia book. 
and uh, we have a small uh, working group in Arizona uh, that have been working on some of these topics for decades, and uh, we'll see more about that uh, as the, the talk unfolds. Um, so the things shared here are uh, informally peer-reviewed, they're not just my own ideas, and we've tried to draw upon existing science, our own working group activities, the Urantia book, and keeping up uh, with the latest information that's coming out through our Urantia community, such as uh, 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 Nigel's videos, which we've been studying for the last six months in our group. So we try to keep up to date on everything and then fold, synthesize uh, what we're working on with what's going on in the rest of the community. So linear gravity as a consequence of the shaping of space by the movement of matter energy through the force ocean of space. Okay, I, that's the definition of gravity. So that's going to take some unpacking. Um, and then with a brief recital of the philosophies of uh, Georges Lemaitre, Einstein, De Broglie, and Bohm. Uh, actually, I got started out in this, pro this particular phase of the project uh, because of an interest in science history. And that's more what I bring to the table. What I find out is I, I learn about these people I get a resonance, resonance with those parts of the Urantia book that say things like, you know, what we're supremely interested in is the scientist. Now, and there's another part that says the universe is not like all these uh, details and facts and axioms and postulates. The universe is like that curious uh, scientist. So when I look out at you folks in the time that I spent with you the last few days, I was saying this is what the universe is like uh, because the universe is interactive and it's, uh, it's creative. And that's what I see. That's what I see in you. So that led me, that kind of feeling, uh, led me to study these uh, scientists' lives and their philosophies. Further, as far as an abstract is concerned, uh, we know from the book, yes, linear gravity is an interactive phenomenon. So or earlier I called it a dance. So we'll talk about what kind of interaction is happening here. Of matter energy as it travels through and meets the resistance of the outspread primordial force ocean of space. There's many different levels. We start out with the absoluta. Um, homogeneous, uh, absolutum rather, homogeneous material of paradise comes out through nether paradise. It's called absoluta, uh, and and uh, space is potentized by the impersonal, unqualified absolute ladling out from the repository and spreading out uh, into space. Uh, until it finally gets down to where we are and some of the things we're experiencing here and uh, segregata. Uh, now, the interesting thing is about this dance is that not only as, as matter moves through this sea, this ocean of pure energy, not only does it interact with it, and we'll describe more about that and waveforms and functions that come about, but also that pure energy is the ancestor of this matter that is now interacting with it. And so it's kind of like a mother now interacting with her child. The child came from the mother, and now the, the child's playing with the mother. In fact, the, the book uses the word womb of space. So uh, as the place where these things take place. Now the Latin for womb is matrix or we get the words mater, or uh, matriarch, or maternal. So uh, it, it's, it's a family affair in that sense. Uh, so when we use the word, when the book says interactive phenomenon, yes, it truly is. This is analogous to a ship moving through water, making paths of greater and lesser resistance. A moving particle both creates a perturbation of space force 
and is piloted along by the self-same wave, field, disturbance, lens, or gravity well. Also, during this short amount of time we have here, I think, I think I'm actually going to end up ahead of time. And because uh, what I have to say is, is so direct. I don't think it'll take a, a, a lot of explanation once we get into these three things of space, force, and matter. Um, but we will have time to talk a little bit about anti-gravity as equal force presence. It's going to be a very important topic. I'm going to flip this over also and say that gravity is unequal force presence. So you can hold my feet to the fire on that all that you want, but we're going we're gonna to talk about what does it mean if the force presence in a localized area is equalized, and what does it mean if it's unequalized, like this. Okay, a case is made for all the standard elementary particles as composed of ultimatons. Uh, so if we talk about a quark or a muon, or, or a neutrino or whatever, I, I'm making the case that all of these are uh, composed of ultimatons. So I want to clarify something, uh, maybe for the, the audience that's watching on. Even though we talk about the electronic stage of matter, yes, the electron was the first one of these standard particles to be discovered in the 1800s. And so the term just kind of stuck. But all of these uh, elementary particles, which we're going to look at, are part of the electronic stage of matter, even though they have nothing to do with an electron. An electron just happens to be one of them. Oh, we happen to have one right here. OK. So um, the electron, I hope one of these ultimatons doesn't fall out, because it might create an explosion or an implosion or something. So I'll try to be very careful here. <laughs> OK, so what we have here is a model of, of the electron, since that was the first one to school. There's only two standard particles that were known of in 1934. Electron had been known for a long time. And then we get this amazing revelation from the Urantia book. It talks about 100 huddling ultimatons, the ultimaton being the, uh, you know, the first uh, materialization of energy that happens uh, you know, out here in this time-space universe that we're living in. And so uh, there's other models that could be made of this. I mean, I, I, if I have to change my mind, this would just be a place saver for right now until something better comes along. Does it have a different shape? Is there something else going on? <clears throat> but I, I, there is more I want to talk about concerning sphere packing. So that's, a, that's an important area of mathematics. But these spheres have... Um, <clears throat> little ones, the Urantia book calls them minute spheres. And we also know from nine, uh, 2018 research, the electron is really, really, really spherical. <laughs> I mean, down to point zero zero, like 25 zeros in a one, it's re really spherical. So I think that's pretty well been determined. So we know the electron is spherical. We know from the Urantia book that the ultimatons are spherical. Okay, so um, the natures of space <clears throat> as ultimate, that's very important, force as pure energy, matter energy, comma, and then the fourth thing as a consequence, not so much a thing, but a consequence, uh, linear gravity, okay, discussed in that order. Cosmic mind from the master spirits to the local universe mother spirits, down to the frandelinks, mediate all these phenomena. Anybody remember <clears throat> what the book says about how many frandelinks there are? It's be beyond, and just in Satania, beyond your numerical comprehension. We couldn't even like write a number for it. It's just like it's just beyond your comprehension. So today, I'm going to be talking about, <clears throat> I mean, most of what we hear, when we, or a lot of what we hear when we come to a, a, a symposium is about, you know, the things that the Urantia book reveals to us about uh, outer space, the center of all things. But today, we're going to talk about just this space right in front of you 
everything I'm going to discuss is within the um, the cubic meter of space right in front of you and you and you, right here. So we're going to dive into it now. Here we go. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to imagine, you know, some other level. This is happening right here. Um, and Cosmic Mind <clears throat> is mediating all these things. And I figure there's a very good chance that there's a Frandelank, since there's so many of them, maybe right there in that space. What do you say? <laughs> uh, think about it. So uh, very good chance, actually. And, uh, okay, so, <clears throat> okay, we'll leave the, the Fran Lakes behind and we'll move on to space. <clears throat> We're responding to the biggest questions in science. Uh, that's the theme. <clears throat> now, in the Urantia book in paper 132, we read, in every age, scientists and religionists must recognize that they are on trial before the bar of human need. Okay, so before the bar, that sounds like, like a courtroom. Okay, okay you're, you're kind of on trial. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, those of us in this room are, uh, so well, what are we doing here? Uh, why did we come? I, I don't know, I, I can only speak for myself. Uh, why did I come and why did I write these and why I've been, uh, have I been working on these for the last few years? Because if there's a little bit of leaven that can blow over somehow, I don't know, I can't do it, but if somehow through our efforts and our education, what we're doing, somehow a little spore, a little bit of leaven, a little bit of yeast, floats over into the scientific community into some really flat, unleavened bread. It's like a brick. And it goes over there and it gets into the dough and it starts to, to do its thing and create this beautiful rising loaf. I mean, we know it's going to happen. It's going to happen eventually. None of us here doubts that. But if there's something that we can do that maybe gets that started, that's going to be huge. Okay, um, <clears throat> talking about what Ralph asked us to deal with was the hard problems, and you pointed out there's like two major magazines that, that basically had articles on the same thing. And if you go to like uh, YouTube on PBS, there's this program called Quantum Gravity and the Hardest Problem in Physics. So Ralph, you're the one that asked me to speak on gravity. So. I didn't pick the topic myself. So here we are, and we're going to deal with the hardest problem, because this is the one that's holding f folks up. They can't, physicists can't mm, unify right now. They're at loggerheads. The macro views of, of, of general relativity <clears throat> and how gravity works with quantum mechanics. Just can't bring this together right now. Um, sometimes you're just asking the wrong question or there's some assumptions that are incorrect. Uh, Freeman Dyson, the famous scientist, says, I don't think you need to bring the two of them together. Uh, so he has a different idea. So maybe there's a little something we're missing here. Uh, but right now, trying to bring two things that aren't meeting up, that's a problem. That's considered, according to this program, the hardest problem in physics. So we are dealing with that. We also have what uh, Neil was speaking about, uh, and what uh, Rupert Sheldrake also uh, takes this terminology, the hard problem of consciousness. And this is a scientific inquiry as well. I'm not going to get into that today, though. <laughs> I wanted to mention that. that, that that's another hard problem. We're going to deal with this, this one that has to do with gravity. Okay. So the, <clears throat> maybe the most important line that I have to share today is the one that's in red letters. Why did I put it in red letters? Because, why, like if you go to Truthbook or something like, I, I go to Truthbook twice a day, by the way. Um, if, if you look up a quotation from the book, and if it's in red letters, that means it's the words of Jesus, the words of the Master. So this is the words of the Master, this one right here. Now, he's our Creator's son. He really gets it. He knows how all this stuff works. Okay, he's giving us a really important clue. Uh, and, and so we're going to, it's really, 
this is going to be pivotal that we sort this one out. Now, we read from, from the book, space comes the nearest of all non-absolute things to being absolute. Space is, apparently, absolutely ultimate. <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, it's like we toss these words, right? like that, that was the, the ultimate cheesecake that I had the other night or something like that, you know. Or, well, that was absolutely wonderful. Uh, you know, and, and we toss these words out. Of course, st students as we are of the Revelation, these words take on you know, very proprietary and particular meanings that we need to unpack. And so we talk about space and the fact that right now, Scientists are having a problem, and they're having confusion, and there it is, failure to recognize the reality of space. So today we're going to talk about, we're going to try to look deeper into this. What is the reality of space? And we're going to talk about space as being ultimate. Okay? None of us can really relate to ultimacy, so I might as well just close up the computer, wrap up the talk. No, no, we're going to go on. We're going to make an attempt to let's, let's find out what do we know about ultimacy. Uh, this is not the function of God the ultimate. This, this is a, a quality or characteristic of space. Even though we, we are in a finite universe, it's not a boundless cube or a limitless circle. Uh, we, we live in a finite universe, and, and this um, the supreme part and experience that we're having right now in the grand universe, yes, it's supreme, and yes, it's finite, but, okay, follow this carefully, the matrix, the substrate, the arena that we're playing this out on is ultimate. It's ultimate space, okay? So it's our playground, and the playground of all these incredible beings that are having this finite and this um, uh, supreme experience are actually doing it upon uh, uh, ultimacy. This is an amazing thing. Why is it? It's like asking the question, you know, uh, what is paradise? Well, the book says paradise just is. And it has no equal, okay? Well, why is space ultimate? Uh, it just is. Okay, so it has certain qualities. It's serviceable in ways that are, are not possible in something, uh, environments that are less than ultimate. Uh, there's transcendent things that can happen in, uh, upon ultimate space. Ultimate can be inside, ultimate space can be inside of, of an atom, which is a space unit, and can travel along with that. Even though all this out here is space, space is traveling. See, there's things that can happen. Things can happen like that in space instantly. They don't require the um, uh, uh, time to transpire. Why, how does this all happen? Well, doesn't this sound like qualities of uh, ultimacy? Yes. Yeah, space is ultimate. So when we read the red letters, we say we're trying to sort out a lot of things here. And we're trying to give scientists and ourselves something to understand what's coming up, uh, down the pike and what's next. We realize, well, okay, we've got to start right here. Confusion at a failure to understand the nature of space. I just listened to a, a YouTube a couple of nights ago, or before I came here, uh, talking about uh, Abbe Ashkatar and loop quantum gravity, which he's one that you want to keep an eye out for. Um, and th so the commentator was starting to talk about Ash Qatar's views and say, well, you know, it looks like we're going to have to be able to quantize space. And then as we look at uh, the descriptions of a space force that occupies space, and the Rianchi book speaks in, way, in such a way that it sounds like space force is also quantized or quantizable. So we're, we're learning some things about the ultimate and what kind of transcendent qualities that it has. Because all the matter and energy that scientists have been so good about figuring out, and large hadron colliders and things like that, all kinds of things have been discovered and charts made, but they take space as well. Well, that's just there. 
well, we don't need to know anything else about it. It's just, it's just the place where everything's happening. Now, this is really, has been, the attitude of, of physicists. Well, that creates confusion. Okay. Okay, space is not merely a concept showing relatedness of universe objects. It cushions space bodies and equilibrates linear gravity. Space is not material, but is rather the womb of material energy matter and precedes them. Okay, so another quality of space is that it's not material. And neither is the force content of space material. It's pre-material, okay? Uh, and we're going to get into that in a minute. Now, if you're talking with a scientist over here at the University of Chicago or some of these conferences you go to, whatever, and you're getting a little bit frustrated because you're amidst a bunch of materialists and they have a materialistic view. And this is another thing that Ralph asked us to deal with um, at this <coughs> symposium was to work on, you know, he wanted to hear something that was pre presented that was beyond just, you know, materialistic science. We don't need to do that at, a, at the Urantia Foundation. We need to go beyond that. Okay, so if space is not material and the force charge of space, the content of space is not material, and you have the scientists over here that are working with the energy matter and motion and, and, and all of their subjects. <clears throat> and you can say, well, he or she is a materialist. Okay, now watch me carefully what I'm saying here. It didn't say anything about God, spirit, or mind. Okay, we've defined the materialists, all those people over there, they don't believe in God, they don't believe in spirit, they don't believe in mind. I'm giving you a different definition. On this ground level, they're materialists because they're only looking at matter energy and they haven't been able to learn anything much about space and the space content, the force. That's enough to make them a materialist. So if you're having a conversation with them, they say, I don't want to talk to you. You're, you're getting into the age of miracles and talking about all these beings and everything, you can say, it's fine. We don't we need to resort to any metaphysical or spiritual or woo-woo um, uh, factors to, for you and I to have a conversation about things that can be explained naturally. And that's why George Lemaitre brought that to the table big time, because the Pope when he saw what George Lemaitre was talking about, he said, oh, well, this, is, this explains creation and the world and everything. And, and Lemaitre said, oh, hold it, hold it. And he got with his, uh, the, the, the science, um, science guy, uh, who's in charge of, of all things scientific at the Vatican. And, and George got with them and said, look, you've got to talk to the Pope. Uh, this is, I don't want to go down that road. Mm -hmm. And so he did, and the Pope said, okay, Forget it. I, I cancel it. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to go out in public anymore and say that, that your theory, which by the way, he never, he never called that the Big Bang. That was a pejorative term that was come up with by um, Fred, Hoyle? Fred yeah, Hoyle, who held to that opinion until his, his death. Um, so Lemaitre was also trying to say, you can hold on to those ideas that you have, because everything that we're talking about actually is as a natural explanation. And we also read in the Urantia book that the operation of anti-gravity is not a function of mind. This is, we're not talking about the mind controlling or, or, or the spirit controlling. You as a personality <laughs> cannot do one thing to change the function of gravity and, and, and particles and energy and physics because it's non-personal. So everything we're talking about is like I'm, I'm talking about non-personal things. Paradise is, uh, is, is material, but it's, it's non-personal. Another paradise is non-personal. The uh, unqualified absolute is non-personal. <laughs> uh, Space is non-personal. Uh, we go on and on. Okay, so as scientists, we're, it, all this is talking, we're talking about you know, non-personal realities. And that's why Lemaitre could say, it's fine. You can hold on to that and we'll continue on with our conversations. Okay. Okay, force. Okay. So 
I, I, I wrote this to uh, uh, Matthew Block. And I said, Matthew, I found where the word force was coined. And it was, it was Michael Faraday, way back in the 1800s. And I don't know, I never heard back from him. <laughs> I'll have to write him again, because I'm, I'm pretty convinced uh, that this is where, and he actually just used the word force. Now, Faraday was just really loved. In fact, Einstein had a, a portrait of Faraday, of Faraday uh, up in his, uh, his study. And so uh, we can call force force, which was Faraday's term, or we can call it primordial force. We can call it force energy. Getting into your answer book terms here now. We can call it the force blanket of space. That's a direct quote. We can call it the vast ocean of outspread force energy of space. We can call it pure energy. We can call it segregata. Or we use David Bohm's term, cosmic sea of energy. And then we, uh, the next ones are in brackets, because I can't be as sure of those as I am. Uh, am of those that I just spoke. But we can talk about, well, is, is there a link out there? With, is, that, is that the same as dark energy? Yes, no, maybe so, or what's the linkage there? Or, or the Higgs field, or zilch. Okay, we move into another quote now. Um, and I think, I'm not sure if we've heard this one yet today, but let's go ahead and read this one. These procession of energy particles, they're like, uh, the Rancher book calls them like a fusillade. That's like, like a whole bunch of bullets coming out of a machine gun. Uh, that's your Rancher book description. Um, or uh, Einstein called them corpuscles. So he has these like quantized amounts. It's like a huge, we took us into the golden era of physics because we were able to start talking about quanta and quantum uh, uh, releases of energy as when an electron changes uh, uh, a, uh, a level. Okay, this wave phenomena is due to the resistance of this undifferentiated force blanket. If there was a blanket right here and I ran into it, I would feel the resistance. If there was, um, uh, 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 you know, some particulate matter, and I ran into it, I would feel the resistance. Now, this is really important, because when I, we were talking about earlier that, like Jesus' words, the problem is that the scientist doesn't understand space. If we don't come away from our studies, a scientist, or in my case, just a science history, history researcher, if we don't come away from that experience and, and knowing that you're gonna meet resistance, from space forces if you're moving through it and plowing through it, and we've missed a big, big thing. But if the science do, scientist of today doesn't understand space and the content of space for, force, then, then he's, he's going to have to come up with all kinds of ideas that are going to be generally dead ends, trying to figure out why did a wave, and we had that good discussion this morning uh, with, with Phil about um, you know, uh, what is ether, or what's the absence of the ether, and what's creating the wave. Okay, so here we, we hear it from the Arantia book. There is resistance. Resistance to move, that's, that's gonna make something happen. And likewise, or similarly, we read, the excitation of the content of space produces a wave. You know, a wave is a ray, and a ray is the wave. They're the same thing, according to the Arantia book. Okay, now this is very much like a a passage of a ship through water. If a big ocean liner was plowing through the Pacific Ocean, creating these huge wakes out from it, then you had a little PT boat over here. Well, if, depending on where the little PT boat was, it was either gonna be pushed off like this, or if it was in the right spot, it might be pulled along. Or if you have a bunch of, you know, a flock of, of geese, uh, and they're flying through the air, and the lead strong adults are, are breaking the wind patterns and, and making way, and the, the younger and the smaller ones are falling along behind. Or a VW following behind an 18-wheeler. It's gonna get sucked along. <laughs> Practically just uh, coast. You did that before, save on gas. 
<laughs> okay, so, so this is your ranch book description. They're giving it to you right there, just right out front. So this is like, it's very much like a, a ship moving through water, if we're talking about particles moving through the force content of space. And then we read, the spheres of all space whirl and plunge on through a vast ocean of outspread force energy. Now, I've got something in bold here. The absence of this hypothetical ether, which my explanation of what the absence is, okay, no ether, ether is absence. But what, what, do we, what we do have is space force. No ether, but we have space force. Now, enables the inhabited planet, whoops, ding, ding, ding. Why did it say inhabited? Why didn't it just say the planet? Okay, I said everything was, was naturalistic and we have basic fundamental laws operating, but you know, we do have these intelligent beings. We have material controllers, one of which is adequate from my reading to, um, you know, counter, counteract the gravity force of the entire Earth. I mean, they're that powerful. Powerful, and they carry within their own beings this quality of anti-gravity. And so, uh, also, our sun can be hooked up to, and I imagine is, to uh, lines of, of energy to keep it replenished. Mm -hmm. And so, if the super universe and the local universe has put that much effort into finally bringing a planet to where it's inhabited, do you think that they're just going to let that, you know, follow its path and eventually decline into the sun? No. So I don't know, it just jumped out of me. Oh, that's what keeps the inhabited planet. So if you're, it's not, there are these natural laws, but there are also beings that can get into the picture when they're instructed to do so and can add a little bit of this or a little bit of that. Or the electron falling in. Okay, dark energy. Okay, so the postulated dark energy, a lot of you have seen this graph. We don't really know what, what this pie is supposed to look like. But um, according to this one, it's 74% dark energy. Okay, is dark energy the same as pure energy, the force charge of space? I don't know, think about it. Okay, standard mo model of elementary particles. So my view is that like we have an up uh, charm, a top, a bottom, a strange, a down, all these different kind of quarks. Ele oh, there's the electron. So the electron is just one of these standard. This entire thing is the electronic stage. Okay, the electron was just the first one to be discovered. And so that's, that's where the name, the name got, came in and stuck. Okay, so... Um, Elementary particles on this table are only slightly responsive to linear gravity. Um, the electron discovered in 1897, the pi, pi on or pi muon, or what the Urantia book calls the mesotron, had just been theorized in 1934. It's published in 1935 by a Japanese scientist, so it just barely got in under the wire. So we had actually only two elementary particles. Now when we say elementary, of course, we're crossing our fingers behind our back. I mean, they're not elementary. They're composed of, of uh, ultimatons. So the word elementary is not quite fit yet. Um, my estimation is that future tables of elementary particles uh, will have a little number up in the corner that shows the number of electron, uh, the, the number of ultimatons that are in that. We don't know what it is that, well, we could put 100 on the electron. So we already got one of them figured out. Okay, all of these, and basically one of these might have, might be a sphere that has four or six or nine or maybe 400. And as that is determined, as the ultimaton is discovered, They'll be figured out and we'll see a number, just like on the periodic table, we see the number of protons that are in each one of the uh, atomic elements. So that's coming up in the future. I'm quite sure of that. I speak like I, I can see the future, but I mean, I can't imagine that 
anything other than that will happen. I'm quite sure it will happen. Okay, so we've been talking about this uh, electronic stage of matter, which is, and then that moves into the atomic stage. Now this is where um, the material space unit really starts to come into play. And as I was saying, that space could actually move along with the atom. This is an atom of uh, helium, two and two and two electrons. Now at this stage, whereas the elementary particles were just barely responsive to linear gravity, this one is fully, fully responsive to linear gravity, and this starts to come into to play. Uh, and uh, the components of, of a nucleus system, uh, I'm sure you can study that on your own. And uh, that neutron diagram is so skeletal that it's probably, I can almost say it's false because it's, it's got so little detail in it about what's happening, but at least we can see the three valence quarks there that sum up to zero. And so, now's the time to breathe. Ah, we've covered a lot of material here. Okay, so, that's like breathing in a little more oxygen, but also breathing in what Tom and I were talking about, it's, it's the universe is not so much like all these facts and everything we figure out, but the universe is like the what inspiring we, artist. Uh, a curious scientist. Curious yep, that's so this is what the universe is like. It's like you folks here. So we just it's a good idea to breathe and just remind ourselves of that and not get too caught up in everything else because even if we get to the place where we can control the revolutions of the automaton, the book says you will not have found God. Mm. You've just gotten one step closer because when we're held to the bar of human need, okay, this can affect pharmaceuticals, energy production, health, wealth, defense, communications. It can affect all those things. I mean, we'll have replicators, we'll be able to make things and all kinds of incredible things will happen. And so that's the bar of human need, you know. The theologians and the philosophers can lead us closer to God, but this study here is going to, to work with human need, even if it doesn't get us one step closer to God. But it still needs to be done. Science needs to go forward. Of course, then you can tell your your family members and your scientist friends and, and those that are into non-dualism and those that, uh, that believe, believe that what's out there is the absolute, the impersonal absolute, you can tell them, yeah, you're right. There is an impersonal absolute. The, the universe, uh, you know, the uh, unqualified absolute, I believe the same thing you do. Yeah, that's running things. And then after you get to know them better, you can say, but you know what? That is a manifestation of the divine, but also the personal is a manifestation of the divine. And then you can get into that. Okay, so a lot of you have seen this, and we know the big thing with the, um, the trampoline with the bowling ball on it. You know, these are kind of crude two-dimensional images, but, but we need some kind of image. That image there looks a lot like Guard's shirt that he's wearing today with the blue and the white grids on it. <laughs> okay. His is going like this, this one's going like this. And so, <laughs> but anyway, but it, it gives us an idea, okay? Um, we would get this idea, like Eddington found out uh, that, that experiment that I guess Einstein had put them up to in the 20s. That, hey, the star is up there. Well, no, it's actually over there. No, no, it's here. Oh, but it comes through and then it bends around the sun, a, a dense body, and then it looks to us like it's over there. And that was what was shown. So that's gravitational lensing. And this is basically Einstein's idea. Yeah, space is being curved. Now, people believe that, but this is what we have to take at the next step, yes. But it's space force that is moving and making way. Like the last person that sat in the sofa, you know, left this indentation, <laughs> some larger than others, okay? And so this part down here is compressed. Mm -hmm. And this part out here has been stretched. Mm -hmm. And it's thinner. And gravity is just that simple. Objects just follow the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. That's it. Now, there's no huge calculations that have to be done. 
if this is stretched out like this and the light beam's coming down and, and the space force is rarefied, like that wake of water in the ocean with a ship moving through it, and it's pushed out like that, then, then the photon or whatever it is just says, great, I'll take that path. <whistles> Whatever's the path of least resistance, that's the way it works. Okay, so this is, this is good because it's a photo, it's not a diagram, where you actually have a space, um, excuse me, a star behind a large starry object, it looks like. And so as, as the light comes, it, it just happens to be right behind from where we're observing. So it comes in and it hits there. Instead of, like, if it was over here, it might just curve around like that. But it happens to hit right in the middle, so it just goes out in all directions. Because all of these directions are paths of, of le lessened resistance for all of those, those photons that are coming at it. So it appears as a ring. And this kind of stuff is observed by astronomers all the time. And then, of course, now they're using gravitational lensing for all sorts of measurements. But this, this is just a nice, this is gravity at work. Okay, so I said we had to understand space, space force, and, and matter. Okay, once we got those three things and got some clarity on, on some details on that, then boom, linear gravity is now perfectly obvious. Okay, it's not on the electromagnetic spectrum, so scientists need to quit looking there. It's not an electromagnetic phenomenon. And I was so glad to hear Phil say this this morning. This is instant. Okay, what is instanter? That's a funny Urantia book word. Big, bigger. Fat, fatter. Instant, instanter. I don't know. I, all I know is it means really instant. <laughs> okay, so uh, this it does not require time to propagate. That's what I'm saying. It's not electromagnetic. We're dealing with ultimate space, and it can propagate, so to speak, any time without the passage of time. That's why quantum entanglement, as Phil pointed out today, is reality. Okay, so gravity is not so much a thing or a force, but it's rather a space and space force condition, or what the Urantia book calls a factor. Okay, these other three are things. Space, uh, space force, or segregata, and matter energy. I guess you could call those things. Gravity is not so much a thing as it is a consequence. The, you know, the space force has gotten warped, so when a particle or an object comes by, it just takes the path of least resistance. Analogous to a ship moving through water, as we discussed. Segregata makes way for apple. Okay, so we're talking about any objects that are in this ocean, now we know it's completely filled, um, that the uh, space has to make way for it. Okay, I say I would rather have a 3D diagram of a particle uh, creating an initial force wave 860 times its diameter. You know, I'd rather, but I, this is the best I can do right now. I have a little uh, paper clip floating on water. I'd, li I'd love to have a really nice model that, sh that you know, showed us more realistically what's going on. But any of, these <laughs> any of these pictures can help us to just think through, yes, yeah, space force is really being pushed out of the way when an object is moving through it because it's meeting the resistance of that force. Um, look at this middle picture. Now, it's, if the particle is not traveling straight forward, but is going around in a corral, and it's held up in a corral, look what happens. Okay, Einstein hated fundamental randomness. Well, you would think that these particles, well, on the left, it looks like they're all just going around, but if you plot after a number of minutes the uh, frequency of the location, it starts to look at that, like that one. Wow. Three concentric blue circles on white. I love it. Can't get better than that. Okay, and um, then the one on the right is an actual um, electron corral. So the thing that's in the macro also happens in the quantum level. Okay, so uh, this is the way that it works. Check this out. I'm using this speaker to vibrate a petri dish containing silicon oil. Now, if I take this toothpick and I make a little droplet on the surface, the droplet will stay there, hovering above the surface. 
the droplet is actually bouncing and it'll keep bouncing for a very long time. Now the reason for this is there's a little layer of air between the droplet and the surface. And the droplet's bouncing so rapidly that that layer never shrinks to about 100 nanometers, which is what it would take for the droplet to recombine with the oil. Now every time the droplet lands on the surface, it creates a wave. But this is a special type of wave, driven by the vibration of the oil bath. It is a standing wave, meaning that it's not traveling out, it's just oscillating up and down. So the droplet makes the wave, and then it interacts with that wave on its next bounce. If the drop lands on one side of the wave, it is pushed forwards. And as long as the bounce of the droplet remains synchronized with the wave, it'll keep landing on the front side of the wave and getting pushed farther forwards. Droplets like these are known as walkers. The bouncing oil drops have been known about since the 1970s, but only recently has it been discovered that you can use these little droplets to replicate many of the strange phenomena of quantum mechanics. Now obviously this is not a quantum system, the droplets are about a millimeter in diameter, but you can think of the droplets like uh, quantum particles, say electrons. One experiment that captures the key features of quantum mechanics is the double slit experiment. If you send is the double slit experiment. Which we're not going to get into, but that, that is an important experiment. So what we've seen here is wave particle duality explained. Uh, macro, uh, this is de Broglie, who came up with this in the 1920s, and David Bohm, who rediscovered it. And uh, as Phil said today, uh, it's consistent with your answer book, and I agree with you on that. Uh, this is, the, the particle creates the wave, and then the wave pilots or guides the particle. And this is what ha is happening right now, even with an electron spinning around a nucleus, creating a little uh, uh, channel almost, you might call it, for it to travel in, creating a tiny gyroscopic uh, anti-gravity situation. Why not have real waves that push around real particles? That's what de Broglie and Bohm were saying. That's quantum realism. Okay, uh, the gyroscope Gyroscope is a fair illustration of anti-gravity. We'll wrap this up. Um, Kelly Tippett, uh, our dear Urantia book reader friend, has a patent, actually several patents now, on this machine. Okay, so the way that we create um, a zone, a localized zone of equal force presence. This is not equal force. This is a model of the prototype, the Venus prototype. And this is in its complete assembly housed with uh, a couple of hemispheres, some assembly pedestals holding in three gyro actuators at 90 degree associations, producing a system of equal one force one. presence. The equal force. Did you hear that? Creating a system of equal force presence. This model. Okay, let's start that over. Okay, we're going to bump up the volume. Currently <coughs> creating a unique condition in the world of physics. Motion physics currently cannot calculate the consequences of these force associations with vector analysis. So we're putting it in 3D orbit so that you can look at it from different vantage points. See that this is a three-dimensional mechanism that's modeled in this computer. What you have here is you have uh, holes in the hemispheres that show the pedestals and the rings. The gold are coils that drive the rotors inside the rings. And you have uh, basically an assembly of the three rings in orbit right now. So right here we have the handles of a mechanism used to be able to grab the mechanism from its center of gravity. And you go ahead and take the handles off now. Okay, now you have just the rings inside the pet. So he's gradually taking this down, and if you get it down to just the rotors, um, you have various densities, uh, tungsten, stainless steel, and so forth, that create uh, equal mass, even the three different size rings. He's using the principles of the Urantia book of creating equal force presence, which you've see, all seen in a gyroscope. The actual force that we've been talking about, the force content of space in the presence of a spinning sphere or mass object or ring creates a localized zone where the force is just equalized out like this and it defies gravity. This is just a fancy gyroscope because it puts it into um, 
x, y, and z axes. And then this was, uh, was very interesting to me that this was spoken about today, uh, detecting ultramatonic rays. Before we find the ultramaton, we're going to detect the ultramatonic ray. And uh, Ralph brought up this question, this mathematical question, okay? This is what I'm putting forth here. And I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, 50 years from now or something, we'll be able to look back on the discussions that we had here this weekend. And it's like if I had a radio right here, an FM radio, and I said, I want you to find the FM station in Chicago uh, for uh, classical music. And you had to go through the entire dial. It would take you a while, but if I told you, please find the radio stations between 89 and 91. And you can go to that and find that station, boom, and there your Bach violin concerto is coming through the speakers and you found it quickly. Same way, if the scientists know what frequency they're looking for, they have a better chance of doing it. I don't know if they're going to find it in electromagnetic. We may have to wait until we have gravimetrics uh, to detect this wave. Um, but anyway, I'm pretty sure it's going to look like that. And if anybody wants to talk about sphere of packing coefficients today, I'd be glad to talk about that. But that's it, and that wraps it up. I didn't have a chance to get into these incredible characters, but it's all in my, my papers. Wonderful, incredible man that had, uh, had great philosophies uh, that, you know, I mean, I'll just read, I'll read one where Einstein says, Jesus is too colossal for the friend, uh, pen of phrase mongers. However artful, no man can dispose of Christianity with a bon mot. That's like a little pat on the head. No one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. Mm -hmm. So this is why I gave you the exact <laughs> newspaper quotation and page number. Because I didn't want anybody to say, oh, you know, there's no way Einstein could have said that. No, this is public knowledge. Okay, that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.